We're in 1 Samuel. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll look at verses 1 and 2, and then I'll give you a basic introduction, kind of a review, and then move into those verses and, and go through the chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, verses 1 and 2. Then the men of kiriath Yearim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in kiriath Yearim a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now, in order to get up to speed, we need to remember what has taken place up to this point. We know that the nation of Israel has been basically under the rule, if you will, at least under the tremendous influence of the Philistines. The Philistines have been uh, thorns in their flesh for a long time. And, and so what had happened is uh, the Philistines had actually captured the Ark of the Covenant from the nation of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was a place where God had chosen to use as the place that he would meet with the nation of Israel while they're in the tabernacle and all. And, and the, the children of Israel, while drawing up to do battle against the Philistines, had actually gone, taken the Ark of the Covenant, brought it out to the battlefield, and as a result, when they lost that battle, they also lost the Ark of the Covenant. And so what happens is the Philistines have taken the Ark, and they've taken that Ark captive, if you will, and taken it to their land. As the Ark of the Covenant is with them, they take the Ark of the Covenant into one of their temples that is dedicated to the fish god uh, Dagon. As they bring the Ark and the Covenant of the Covenant into that particular temple area, they place it in a place of submission, if you will, to Dagon. And, but the next day they walk in, they walk in on the next day, they find that the, the uh, fish god has actually fallen before the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of the fact that God is superior. They didn't understand that. They didn't regard it. And as a result of that, they put the... Uh, the idol back in its place, and the next thing day came back. This time the head and hands have been cut off, and they're on the threshold. And so they haven't gotten the message whatsoever. They didn't realize the futility of idol worship. They didn't see uh, that uh, the fact that their idol was laying before the Ark of the Covenant, that this was going to symbolize something that, uh, that the nation of Israel worshipped a God that is superior to theirs. They didn't understand that at all. It should have made them aware of the fact that their idolatry is futile to be involved in, but they didn't awaken to that. I mentioned to you that in the Old Testament, God has made it very clear that we're not to have idols. From the very, very beginning, when God began to speak concerning the commandments that he gave to the nation of Israel, he said to them, I am the Lord thy God, you shall have no false gods before me. He also went on into saying to them that they are not to have any idols and not to have any graven images of anything in heaven on earth or below the earth. And yet, the nation of Israel uh, had a habit of falling into idolatry. God had said, I specifically prohibit you from this form of worship because it's taken from God and worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And uh, as a result of that, the nation of Israel found itself very often in bondage because it would go into idolatrous worship. Isaiah, when he was writing some 750 years before Christ, was writing concerning the futility of idolatry. And, and he said in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 7, speaking of the goldsmiths, he says, they, the goldsmith fastens the idol with pegs that it might not totter. In other words, they have to fasten it down so it doesn't fall over. It was just another way of saying they have no real life within themselves. Men have to help the idol. The idol doesn't help men. In the same book, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 7, uh, he wrote, they bear it on the shoulder. They carry it and set it in its place, and it stands. From its place it shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. He's saying, this is lifeless. It has no way to help you. You actually have to carry it wherever you want it to go. It doesn't carry you. God, on the other hand, is the one who carries you as a, as a, a, a shepherd will carry a, a, a lamb, as a father will carry a son. Even so, God carried the nation of Israel. But in idolatry, you have to carry that idol around. So the Philistines should have understood that this God that, that the nation of Israel worships is superior to the God that they have worshiping, uh, been worshiping. But instead of returning the ark, what they did is they just moved it from place to place, and they did so for seven months. Now, they would take it to each one of 
their main cities. The Philistines had five main cities and they would take this Ark of the Covenant and they'd take it to one of their main cities and while it's there, a plague would break out. They'd have an infestation of rats and, and so instead of returning it to Israel, they actually take it through all of the main cities of the Philistines and finally become aware of the fact that this bad that is happening to us is in connection with the God of Israel. And so they take the Ark of the Covenant, they put it on a cart, they have two milk cows, they send the cows off the road and down the road they go and they take the Ark of the Covenant all the way to a place called Bet Shemesh which was a priestly city and as they bring the Ark of the Covenant there the people of Bet Shemesh see it coming they get really excited but they look into the Ark which is another way of saying they treated it with disrespect as a result of that God's anger uh, broke out against them and now they're afraid and so they say we need to get rid of the Ark let's send it somewhere else well, in chapter 6, verse 21, it says that they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Yerim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it with you. And so they got rid of the ark because of what was taking place there. And that's what we pick up with here in chapter 7 at verse 1. So it says, then the men of kiriath Yerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. Now I wish that it would just simply say the men of Chino did that. It's easier to pronounce Chino than kiriath Yerim. That's been a tongue twister all this time. And instead of Abinadab, how about Bob? <laughs> but what happens is what they do is they take the, uh, the ark and they treat it properly. It would seem that Abinadab was a priest and he consecrated his son to take care of the ark and so it's there. But I want you to see verse 2 because it says, So it was that the ark remained in kiriath Yerim a long time. It was there 20 years. Now that is a long, long time. For 20 years, Israel remains under the rule of the Philistines. For 20 years, Israel continues neglecting God and pursuing false gods. 20 years is a long time. Sometimes we don't realize how long that is, but 20 years is a long time. Marie and I were in San Luis Obispo recently and the pastor of Calvary Chapel there is a friend of mine and so we were having lunch with him and his wife and while we were there having lunch, his wife uh, said something about 1970. And, and, and I said, 1970 is when I was born again. That's the year I got saved. And her husband turns and looks at me and says, 1970 is the year I was born. <laughs> you know, time is an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing completely. I mean, the fact is, 20 years for us, as we consider 20 years, it may not seem very long for some. It may seem like a long time for somebody else. If somebody told me, you have 20 years to live, at my age, I'd be thinking, well, I'll die when I'm 78. But if you're 20 and somebody says you have 20 years to live, that seems like a very short time because you'll only be 40 when you die. And so 20 years is a long time. It depends on how you look at it. Here in the United States, you know, in the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of things take place in 20 years. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing this study, I actually Googled the historic events 20 years ago just to see some of the things that took place in 1989. Some of you are too young to remember this and others can't remember it because you can't even remember where you live anymore. I mean, yeah, kind of like me. But 20 years ago, 20 years ago, the world's population was 5.19 billion. Today, it's estimated at 6.76 billion. 20 years ago, the Berlin Wall was torn down and East and West Germany were reunified. Mikhail Gorbachev was named Soviet president and George H.W. Bush was elected president of the United States. 20 years ago, U.S. troops invaded Panama. The Exxon Valdez sent uh, 11 million gallons of crude oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound. There was a San Francisco Bay Area earthquake that measured 7.1 in magnitude and killed 67 people and injured over 3,000. 20 years ago, the federal debt was $2.68 trillion. Today, it's approximately $11 trillion. Unemployment was 5.3%. Average monthly rent was $420. The average house was $120,000. A new car cost $15,000. 
20 years ago, the best picture of the year was Rain Man, and the record of the year was Don't Worry, Be Happy, <laughs> which is something we need today. The very first World Wide Web server and browser was developed by Tim Berners 20 years ago with Al Gore's help, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, 20 years ago was a long time. In the case of the nation of Israel, the children of Israel continued neglecting God and chasing after idols. But during that time, Samuel, who is a judge, priest, as well as a prophet, undoubtedly has been going throughout the area, the nation of Israel, bringing God's message to the children of Israel. Undoubtedly, he's gone from north to south, east to west, and he has been presenting to them the mind of God. We know that his voice was recognized as authoritative because in 1 Samuel, in chapter 3, verse 20, it had said all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, from north to south, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And so as these 20 years continue and, in, and the nation of Israel endured 20 years, God is still bringing a message to the prophet Samuel who is going through doing his duties and sharing with people. And over 20 years, Israel finally came to her senses and returned to the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 2, how it simply says, all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now the word of lament uh, actually carries a joyful connotation. To, to lament means to go after something in a mourning, M-O-U-R, mourning condition. It, it speaks of seeking after something with great humility. And so the point that he was making is during the 20 years, Israel became broken before the Lord and sought him. So gradually through the influence of Samuel, Israel sorrows over their sin and begins to seek after God. They have a sorrow over their sin, but also a joy and a renewed desire for fellowship with God. It's one of those things that, that is, it's almost like a paradox. You sorrow and yet you have joy. There's a sorrow, but there's the joy. And that's what took place because in their sorrowing over their sin, they were able to return to him, and that's what's taking place. And so as they're lamenting after the Lord, as they're broken and they're beginning to seek how they can get restored to God, notice verse 3, Samuel speaks to them. It says, Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Asherahs from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Asherahs and served the Lord only. And so they're lamenting, they're seeking after God, they're in misery, they've been in misery for so long. So, so Samuel says, listen, if you want to get over the misery, you need to repent. If you have a sorrow over sin, God can forgive you. You need to follow the Lord completely, and you need to produce fruits of righteousness. So he says, you need to return to the Lord. Notice that, you need to return to the Lord, and you do so with a completely sincere heart. What that is, is a call to repentance. Now, the word repent, a lot of times when you hear the word, it's a biblical word, a lot of people don't understand what it means, especially our society that we live in today doesn't use the word repent very often, therefore doesn't understand it. When you, when you think repent, sometimes people will have cartoons with somebody who's dressed in sackcloth and he's got a big sign and it simply says repent and they're always strange looking people, naturally strange looking people saying repent. The word repent means to change your mind. The original language in Greek, it's metanoia. It means a change of the mind. It's a change of the way that you're thinking. When God would call the nation of Israel to repentance, he was saying to them, you need to change the way that you think. You need to stop thinking that you can get right with me by chasing after idols or being involved in the things that you're involved in, God would say. You need to change your mind and, and what you think I appreciate and, and want from you. You need to change your mind and you need to listen to the prophet, you need to listen to the word of God in order that you might know what I'm pleased with and change your mind about the things that you're pleased with now so that you can now turn to me. You need to repent. And so what he was saying is you need to return to the Lord. It's a call for repentance. And, and the thing is, is if you repent, he's saying God will receive you. In the book of Isaiah 55 verse 7, Isaiah the prophet wrote, Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
Hosea 6.1 says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. You know, sometimes we think, if I return to the Lord, will the Lord receive me? Well, the Bible says, yes, if you turn to me, I will not cast you out. And so that's what he's saying here. He's saying, you need to return to the Lord. Come back to God with complete sincerity. He also says, put away the foreign gods and the ashtoreths from among you. When he says, put away the foreign gods, he's speaking about Baal and Astarte. Baal and Astarte were, were gods that really originated, the worship of them originated in Babylon. They were also referred to at this time as Phoenician idols. And, and uh, they normally were together because they believed, uh, the, the idol worshippers believed that Baal and Astarte were husband and wife. And so they represented nature. They represented reproductive power. And the way that their devotees would worship them oftentimes would be including sexual orgies. It's similar, if you will, to the uh, festivals of, of Bacchus that you have, the Mardi Gras, which is a, a wild time of partying and a lot of sexual orgies, and that's how they worship them. Astarte is also known as Ishtar. She's also been known as Aphrodite, and in Jewish mythology was known as the demon of lust. And so what he's saying here is he's saying, one, return to God, and two, repent from your sexual immorality. Now, in the Old Testament, when you study your Old Testament, you'll discover that God declares himself to be the husband of Israel. Isaiah 54, verse 5 says, For your maker is your husband. And so when the nation of Israel would go after false gods, they were called harlots. They would go into what is called harlotry. It was spiritual fornication. It was actually considered in the Old Testament spiritual adultery because they were betraying their covenant relationship that they had with God through the law of Moses. And as a result of that, God would deal with them in a spiritual way because in their going off into idolatry, which very often included sexual immorality, they were sinning greatly against God. And so God in his word would say to them, you have committed adultery against me. Now in the New Testament, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as well as Ephesians chapter 5, the church is looked at as being the bride of Christ. In the Old Testament, Israel is the wife of God. The New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ. And yet the church as well as Israel are commanded in both the Old and the New Testament to remain faithful to God. Now God said that they are not to have relationships with people outside of the tribe of Israel. And there's a reason why. It's because if they were to pursue the women of a foreign nation or the men of a foreign nation, the gods of that nation would infect the nation of Israel. Solomon is regarded as the wisest man. The Bible tells us that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the Bible also tells us in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3, that Solomon's wives drew his heart away from the Lord. He was influenced by their idolatry, even went so far as beginning to build high places so that their wives, his wives could worship their idols there. And so that's what takes place. And God is saying, turn away from this idolatry. Turn away from it because it has a spiritual core. In the book of Numbers, there's a man that we know of by the name of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet. He was not a Jewish man, but he's used as a prophet in the book of Numbers. There was a king by the name of Balak who wanted to have the, the nation of Israel, whom he feared, he wanted the nation of Israel to be cursed because he was afraid of them as they were marching in and taking the land. So he went to this man by the name of Balaam, and he says, I'll give you a great sum of money if you'll curse them. Well, Balaam wanted the money desperately, but he knew he couldn't curse the nation of Israel. He said, I cannot curse the ones whom God has not cursed. So three different times he's approached, and three different times instead of bringing cursings, Balaam brings blessings on the nation of Israel. 
So Balak is really upset with him and says, I would have made you a very rich man. Well, that caused Balaam to be greatly upset. So he came up with a plan. He devised a way to deal with it. And what he did is he said, listen, the children of Israel have a jealous God. All you need to do is get these, uh, the, the people of Israel to, to intermarry, to have relations with the, uh, with the uh, pagan women around them. And, and though I cannot curse them, God will chastise them and you'll get exactly what you want. You'll, you'll find the nation of Israel being dealt with by their God. I can't curse them, but God indeed will deal with them. And when you study through the book of Numbers and you get into Numbers chapter 25, you see that they followed the counsel of Balaam and God brought judgment judgment on the nation of Israel. So God does not put up with any false gods. Christians are to worship God alone. Believers are to worship God alone. And so one, we have Samuel saying, if you want God's hand of blessing to be on you, you need to return to him. Two, you need to put away those false gods. And then three, he says, prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. That word prepare means to settle or arrange. In other words, you shall have only one God, you shall have no foreign gods. Deuteronomy 13.4 says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him, keep His commandments and obey His voice, and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot worship two things. You can only worship one thing with all of your heart. Worship God or worship the world, but you cannot worship both. You have to make a choice. Well, the result here is the children of Israel put away the Baals and Asherahs and served the Lord only. Now notice in verse 5, it says, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. The word Mizpah means watchtower. And what this is, is he's saying, I want you to come to this high region, this region that can be seen by all. See, when you're on top of this high hill looking down, you can see everything below, but everybody who's down there looking up the hill can see you too. And so what they did is they were there on a hill that was, was uh, capable of anybody looking to be able to see. Everybody would see them. So this would be an outward declaration of faith in God. You're going to do this in the open. If you're going to have a relationship with God, it's not going to be in a closet. It's going to be in the open. It's going to be in such a way that the people all around you can see that you have made a choice to follow God. That's what he's saying. Christians aren't supposed to be living in the closet, in other words. Believers aren't supposed to have their faith in the closet. We don't just take it on and, and use it on Sunday and then the rest of the week we just go off and hide our faith. We're to do it in an open fashion. When we have open invitations here in this church, that's the point that we're making. We're saying, listen, we're not asking you to be a chameleon Christian. We're not asking you to be an under, undercover kind of person. We're saying, if you're going to follow the Lord, do so openly. And so you have an open invitation where people will come forward in front of witness and say, yeah, I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he did. He says, you're going to make your, your relationship renewed with God. You're returning to the Lord in the open. And not only that, notice in verse 6, he poured out some water. Now, pouring out water is a symbol of repentance. All you need to do is go into the desert, and you understand that water is life in the desert. So pouring out water symbolizes a pouring out of a person's life. I am, I am dependent on you completely. And so they're there repenting and, and opening up to the Lord. And then it says, and they fasted that day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. Fasting is symbolic of, of mourning over sin. And so they're confessing. They're returning to the Lord and they're, they're repenting and they're confessing their sin. No more excuses. No more blaming my sin on somebody else. I completely own my sin. I did it. They're mourning over their sin. They're overcome with moral grief. You know, as a minister, there are times that I'm speaking to somebody and they're telling me that their life is... It's not going well. I mean, a lot of people's lives don't go well. Sometimes periodically, sometimes through seasons. Sometimes it just doesn't go well for a long time. And 
And as I've talked and ministered to people over the years, there are times when I'm talking to somebody and they'll say, you know, I'm just not doing well. And as we begin to talk, and well, I need some prayer. And I'll say, of course, what can we pray about? And we begin to talk. And then it turns out that they've been involved in, in particular sin or a sinful lifestyle for a while. And then you say, well, you know, you need to turn away from that. Oh, well, you don't understand. You know, I was raised this way. You don't understand. That's how it's always been. You don't understand. When I hear that, I can tell you that person's not going to get well. They're not. They're going to stay exactly where they're at. They're not going anywhere. Why? Because they don't hate the sin. Because they don't hate it. You know, I was raised in, in the Catholic Church, and there are some people here who may recognize this phrase. You know, we used to go to the uh, Catholic Mass. It was in Latin, the Latin Mass, Tridentine Mass. And there was a point that we would repeat in Latin, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. My fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. And we would pound our, our chest as we did it. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It is my fault, it is my fault, it is my most grievous fault. I was taught very early that it is my fault. It's easy for me to blame other people. I can say, well, I didn't get a puppy when I was six. I wanted a bicycle when I was 10. That's, when I, that's why I became a thief and stole other people's bikes because I really wanted that Schwinn bicycle. I mean, I can, you know, I can do that. Anybody can do that. The reason I drink is because drink was around the house all the time. My parents partied all the time, and so I would find the glasses, and they still had some vodka, or they still had some whiskey or beer or whatever, and I would drink it, and I started doing that when I was six years old, someone could say. And for me, it was just a natural thing for me to continue drinking, and then I eventually just began to drink because that's just the way it is. We can do that. Oh, yeah, I get mad at people, but you know what? You don't understand. You know, I'm from a culture that we just, we get mad easily, and we take it out on people easily. I mean, that's the way it is with us, and uh, that's the way I am. All of these things are excuses. Not a single one of those things am I saying, listen, I'm sick of this, and I don't want to drink anymore. I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to be angry anymore. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying is, well, I am that way, but there are reasons for it. You're never going to get well if that's what you do. Never. You are going to give yourself excuses until the day you die to remain exactly as you are and then you're going to wonder why you were never set free. You were not set free because you, you wanted to continue having that. You were entangled with that and you kept it. Me, when I got saved, I finally said, I hate the way I am. I hate it. I hate how I treat people. I hate how I'm always drunk. I hate the drugs that I'm taking. I'm hating the life that I have, the hopelessness and the helplessness and all of the anger that I'm feeling. I hate it. I can't take it anymore. God, help me. Forgive me. And I hear the gospel that says, you need to repent. And I say, I agree with you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I am that. I am that person. Lord, in your name, forgive me, a sinner. That's what God calls you to do. Not make excuses for the things that we're doing, but to actually walk away from those things. In Psalm 51, verse 4, the psalmist said, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so they're getting right with God, and they're doing so in the open. Well, notice verse 7. Now, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mitzpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So the Philistines, upon seeing what is taking place, immediately moved to destroy Israel. You see, not everybody's happy when you get right with God. Not everybody rejoices the day that you get saved. And as a matter of fact, you might have some people who don't like you saved. They don't even like the fact that you're even saying you're saved. Before I got saved, I was a joke. I was a party. I was the one that the people used to laugh at. Not with, laugh at. And I did so intentionally. I was the joker. That's what I did. I can still remember, for example, I was about 18, 19 years old. A friend of mine had a 1963 Ford Galaxy convertible, a good-sized car, and, and I climbed on the hood, and, and he drove it down the street in front of my house, and, and I stood on the hood as a living hood ornament. I stood with one foot out like that, my arms outstretched, and we drove on down the street, you know, about 30 miles an hour as I was like that, and we drove by my house. And my mom was home, and my mom looked outside and saw her son driving by as a living hood ornament. That woman was not happy. She was not happy at all. And when I went into the house, my mom let me know how unhappy she was. She wasn't saved, so she used certain language that I don't want to repeat in public, but she was a very upset woman when that happened. 
She was very, very mad. What kind of idiot are you? And I said to her, Mom, what's the big deal? You could have fallen off that car. You could have gotten killed. What's wrong with you? You need detention that bad? You're willing to be that stupid? And I just looked at my mom. I said, you know, whatever. You know, you don't have a sense of humor. I wasn't going to get hurt. It's okay. I'm in control. That's the way I was. I would go to parties, and I would start out my Friday nights when I started partying on Friday night with a quart of beer and a half, ga half gallon of wine. That's how I started out the night. I drank a quart of beer and a half gallon of wine when I was 18 years old. That's how I began my night, and then I moved on from there into the drugs and everything else. That's the way it was. That's how I drank. That's the way it was. And I was drunk, and I was loaded uh, all the time. That was my lifestyle. And so when I'd go to the parties, and I'd be drunk, they'd have some music playing. The kids usually would be dancing. Nobody's dancing. I was drunk. I'd get up, and I'd start dancing in the middle of the dance floor like Joe Cocker or somebody just acting all weird and silly, and people would laugh. And, and that's what I did. I was the joke. I was the person that the people laughed at. And for me, having attention was better than feeling nobody knew you were alive, and that's what I did. And then I got saved. When I got saved, I stopped doing that. When I got saved, I started getting sober-minded. When I got saved, I stopped being that kind of person. And then I have my friends saying to me, you changed. We don't like the way you've begun to be. How come you're not any fun anymore? How come you're not doing these things anymore? You used to be so much fun to be around. You don't drink anymore. You're not doing the dope anymore. You're not doing those things anymore. How come? What's wrong with you? They were not happy. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you have friends who did the same thing. Some of you have family members who felt the same way. What happened to you? I could handle you when you were a drunk. I could handle you when you were doing drugs, but I can't handle you as a Jesus freak. What happened to you? And they don't like it. I met a girl named Marie. Marie came to Christ in my Bible study. Marie and I began to date a couple months after she got saved. We'd go to church together on Sunday nights. She'd go to Mass with her mama Sunday morning. Then she'd come with me on Sunday night. Mama's a very strong Catholic woman. Used to come into the room with holy water and sprinkle it on her when she was asleep. Very strong Catholic gal. I love her to pieces. Love her to pieces. Well, Marie's walking with the Lord, and she's saying, you know what, I, I want to be water baptized. So we're at church on a Sunday night. They're having a baptism. And she goes and is water baptized. And she, you know, I drive her home. Her hair is soaking wet. And we pull up into her driveway. And she says, my mom's not going to be real happy when I go in right now with my hair all wet. She's going to ask me what happened, and I'm going to tell her I got baptized, and my mom's going to be very angry. So I look at her, and I say, do you want me to go in with you? She says, no, I'll go in by myself. And I said, thank you, Jesus. I burned rubber and took off. <laughs> well, Marie went in to her doom. Mama was not happy. Exactly what we expected. Mama was not happy. I baptized you as a baby. I've raised you right. What are you doing? The whole thing. Not everybody gets excited when you completely turn to the Lord. Not everybody does. These Philistines were not happy at all because they lost the people who at one time had been under their thumb. They got angry that Israel was now coming back to their God. And so what do they do? Well, it says in verse 7, the Philistines heard the children of Israel had gathered together at Mitzvah. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And so there's this fear as they have taken the step and, and they say, please keep us in prayer because we know that we're about to go into a very tough time. Well, in verse 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel and the Lord answered him. Now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mitzpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. 
So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And so notice with me that Samuel takes a suckling lamb. A suckling lamb was around seven days old. The suckling lamb is small and is tender, and so that represents the new and fresh life Israel has in the Lord. It's a picture of conversion. And he burned this lamb whole because a whole burnt offering is a picture of complete consecration. Now, as Samuel's offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle. So the lamb's being sacrificed, and the armies of the Philistines are drawing up to battle, and Israel now has great fear. But as this is taking place, God now steps in and thunders against the Philistines. In Isaiah 59, 19, it says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You see, the result is that God is, is strengthening Israel. The Philistines begin to flee in confusion. The Scripture says, What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? One of the things that you're going to learn is when you open your mouth up for the Lord, when you begin to live openly for Him, and you say, God, here am I, use me, you're going to be amazed at what happens when God gives you opportunities to just open your mouth and be used of the Lord. You know, I began to do that when I first got saved. When I was going to school in the early 70s, you know, I went to the military for two years, got out, went to Bible college for a year, and then I went to secular schools for another year, then returned to Bible college. But when I was in secular schools, when I went back to school, you know, I walked in there, and I was still a relatively new Christian. I really didn't know that much. I was learning, I was studying, I was trying to grow. But I would go into class and I would say, God, you need to fill my, my mouth with your wisdom. I, I'm reading your word so I have something that can come out, but I need you to give me wisdom because in classes, and that was back in the 70s, there was still an antagonism towards the things of God. And I asked the Lord very early, as I encourage you to do this, to, to, to teach me to have the courage, to be like Paul when Paul said, pray for me that God will give to me boldness, that I might speak the way that I ought to speak. And so I would enter in, and I knew that if I don't declare myself, if my colors are not clear, if people do not know that I believe in Jesus Christ, that ultimately a lot of class days are going to go through where things are being said, so I might as well say something from the beginning when given an opportunity. And that's what I would do. And I was in secular college. I would stand up and I would say, I'm a Christian. This is what I believe, and this is where I stand in these things. And I would draw a line. I did that every time that I'd go in class, and they'd give me an opportunity. The reason was because I did not want to hide my colors. I did not want to be a closet believer. I was going to be open for Jesus Christ. I believed it then. I believe it now. You need to be open for the Lord. And you'll be surprised when you begin to stand up and say, you know, God, here am I. Use me. Here's my mouth. Use it for your glory. You'll be surprised how the Lord will actually meet you there. Jesus said, if you keep his word, he says, my Father and I will come with you. He said, it, and will be in you, and I will manifest myself to you. And there are times when the Lord will just manifest himself. It's found in John 14, 21. He will manifest himself. You will say something, and you'll say, my goodness, that was the Lord. And God does it. And there have been times when I've spoken, and I'm not a wise man, especially when I was in my early 20s, just out of drugs and alcohol abuse. You know, what did I know? I was once lost, now I'm found. I'm blind, now I see. I was deaf, now I hear. That's all I really know. But you know what? I was willing to give what I had, and God would use that, and he'll use you too. All you need to do is be willing. All you need to do is say, here, my Lord, I want to be used by you, and I'm willing that people know what I am. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And God began to move here, and he did so in a wonderful way. Now, as the victory comes, notice verse 12. Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzvah and Shen, called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. They had a significant victory, so he puts the Ebenezer, the stone of help. It, it's a memorial stone. He's saying, God has helped us, but we continue to need his help. And as a result, the Philistines were subdued. This significant victory was something Israel would remember. And so they put the stone of remembrance there to keep the victory before their eyes constantly. Whenever they would pass by, they would see the Ebenezer. They'd see the stone and they'd remember, God met us here in a special way. I have many stones of remembrance. I was in Hollywood uh, not that long ago and we were driving and, and we passed by this place called, uh, uh, it was uh, the Hollywood Palladium. And, and as we drove by, I, I turned to my wife, Marie, and I said, the Hollywood Palladium, I haven't seen this for years. I can't remember the last time I saw the Hollywood Palladium, but I got saved there in 1970. And as I was going by, the, that to me is an Ebenezer. It's a stone of remembrance. 
I have a lot of places like that. I go past my parents' house where I began to teach Bible studies in 1973. My mom and dad sold their house a long time ago, but I drive by that every once in a while when I'm in the area. Drive by my, the house that I grew up in, and it's an Ebenezer to me. It's a place that God met me. That's where I started teaching Bible studies. Or here in Ontario, I'll go by the Vine Street. There's a little church on Vine Street. I drive by that every once in a while just to remember how God met us there when our church had 60 people. Or I go past a house in Ontario that my sister-in-law owns now. It's a place that, that this church began in. And, and I go by that, and that's a stone of remembrance. Or I'll go by uh, Central School in the city of Ontario. I can drive by that, and I remember that we started our Bible studies there when we left Vine Street. Or I can go to Ontario Christian Elementary School, and, and I'll go onto the campus there, and, and I'll remember we used to meet here, or Ontario High School, or, or a small little building there on Maple Street uh, in, uh, in Ontario. All of those places are stones of remembrance, places you can go by and you can say, God met me here, God met me here, God met me here in a special way. And that's what the Ebenezer is. And I wonder if you have a stone of remembrance, a place where you got saved, a place where God met you, a place where you asked your, your, your girlfriend to be your wife, a place that is just a beautiful memory in your life that you know God brought this together and he made this a special memory for us, the stones of remembrance. And that's what they had in Ebenezer. Every time the nation of Israel would go past that stone, they'd remember God met us here in a very powerful and a very special way. We all have places like that in our life. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mitzpah, judged Israel in all those places. But notice verse 17, but he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. There he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. He always returned home. God gives us opportunities to do ministry and we get to go various places, but you always return home, a place where God meets you. He set up an altar there where he would offer sacrifice. People of Israel could come offer sacrifice to God. Ministry begins in your home. I have people approach me on occasion who say to me, I'd like to be a pastor. I feel called by God to be a pastor. Are you married? Yes, I am. I'd like to eventually meet the wife. Because I have discovered that if a man can lead his wife in the things of God, he can lead other people. But if that wife doesn't respect him, if that wife won't follow him, well, she knows him better than anybody else. See, it's easy for a man to come up and stand behind a pulpit just like this, on a platform just like this, and to give a great message. Because the people there in the congregation only see you for that period of time. Then you go into the back. And me, I have a woman who's waiting for me there, my wife. And if I can lead her, I can lead this church. If she can respect me as a man of God, then I can speak with sincerity to this congregation. But if my wife will not listen to me and follow my lead, if my, mom, my wife rather rejects that from me, rejects the word of God, then I'm really not able to minister the word effectively, am I? So when people say, I want to be a minister, ministry starts at home. It starts in your house. If you're married, it starts with your wife. Your first youth group, your children, your first group of seniors, your parents. Do they respect you? Do they see the call of God on you? Do they say, I can learn from you? My first Bible studies were to my mom and my dad. If you can teach your mom and your dad the ways of God, you can teach anybody because they raised me and they saw the changes that God brought in my life. And so what we have is a man who went from place to place ministering, but he always came home and there he offered his sacrifices and there he had his ministry. It always begins at home. Father, I ask that you would work in us, Lord, I ask that you would continue just to show yourself strong on our behalf, Lord. 
and that we might have a sincere love for you and serve you, Lord, with all that's within us. And lift up this congregation and do pray in Jesus' name that you, Lord, that you would just bless us, Lord, as we love and serve you. We thank you, Lord, that we can run for 20 years, even as Israel did, but it only takes a moment to return. And some in this room, Lord, have been running for a long time, but this is their moment to return. Our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, and perhaps I have some in this room right now who need to get right with the Lord. I want to ask you, as our eyes are closed, right where you're at, if you need prayer, you need to get right with Jesus, you can do so right there. You can open yourself up and say to him, God, be merciful. I need you. I believe, Lord, and I want to pursue you. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. And if you have a desire right now to be right with the Lord, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand wherever you are? Let me pray for you. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised. I'm asking that you would reach down now and touch them. And I thank you, Lord, because you are a God who is merciful. And you say, just return to me. And Lord, that's what we're doing even now. I'm asking that your hand would be on us all, Lord, especially with their hands raised to you, that you'd wash and cleanse that you'd fill them with your spirit and peace. And I ask that they would have a freshness in you from this day forward. And we thank you, Lord. Bless you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you keep moving amongst us all to your glory in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll close with a word of prayer and a song. And again, tonight we do have our How to Give Away Your Faith you want to learn to be equipped, I encourage you to be part of that. Our Father, would you work in us and would you use us to glorify Jesus? We give you praise for this as we go into the mission field. May we be found faithful as we serve you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. We'll have our... We'll have our meeting for the Israel trip in a few minutes. God bless you guys.